It's a beautiful day here at the ballpark. Welcome to VI Sports, a show that takes you beyond the scoreboard, bringing you stories from across the Vancouver Island sports team. Those fans are getting excited. We're here hosting from Royal Athletic Park as the Victoria Harbor Cats take on the Gresham Grey Wolves. We're going to introduce you to some of the members of the Victoria Harbor Cats in just a bit. Plus, we're going to talk about what's new this season here at the park. But first, let's preview what's on today's show. A shamrock dream turned reality. A look back at when Nanaimo made lacrosse history. Island athletes vault to new heights. And the small but mighty community of BMX Victoria. Those stories coming up in just a little bit, but right now I'm with Harbor Cats general manager, Brad Norris Jones. Brad, give me an idea of what this year's version of the Victoria Harbor Cats looks like. Who are these guys? Where are they from? Well, most of our kids are from California, Arizona. We have uh, a record number of five Canadians this year, which is very exciting. Um, a more mature team, a lot of uh, juniors. Uh, I have seven or eight returning players from last year, so we're looking forward to another good season. And let's talk about, because a special moment in the franchise recently, eight players, eight Harbor Cats drafted in the majors uh, just in early June. What does that mean to you? What does that mean for this franchise? Well, it shows our fans that we have quality players that uh, come to this city. Uh, now we have 30 players that have been drafted in Major League Baseball, so it's very exciting. Sure, and let me ask you a little bit about the uh, promotions you got planned for this summer, because there's always, you always have the funky promotions at the Harbor Cats. That's what I love about coming to this park. Uh, give us a taste of what's in store. We do. Uh, always the fan favorites, the fireworks nights, where we have those this year. But one of my, my new ones is we have Bark in the Park. And uh, we're, you know, going to have all the dogs out here and uh, it's something different. It gets uh, done in a lot of U.S. cities and it's successful. What's cleanup duty like? Or who's on cleanup duty for that one? I think Jim Swanson's got that one. <laughs> Growing up in the greater Vancouver area, it was always my dream to center a line with Pavel Bure on the left wing, Alex McGillney on the right. Didn't quite work out for me, but as we learn in our first story, some childhood sports dreams can come true. It's every young sports fan's dream. I think surreal is a good way to put it. From awestruck childhood fan to playing with the team. Huge fan for, for years and now actually getting to be on the other side of things is, is pretty phenomenal. Victoria Shamrock's rookie Josh Fagan grew up in the West Shore. His sport was lacrosse, his heroes wore green. I still remember going out in the front yard with a couple of buddies and pretending that we were the Gates. The Belmont secondary grad watched his idols become Man Cup champions. Going to games was a weekly ritual. Five or six years old, uh, my dad started taking us down to uh, Old Memorial Arena. Just extremely exciting. Walking in and getting to watch all those guys play was pretty phenomenal. It's nice to have guys who have that dream because they're going to go that extra, that extra mile. On the blue line, short, short, long. If you've played your whole life as a, as a lacrosse player in Victoria, this is where you want to be. Force him out! Don't let him out! Don't let him out! The Juan de Fuca minor lacrosse alum developed his game at Concordia University, Irvine, in California. He then played with the Nanaimo Senior B Timberman and is in his first year in the Western Lacrosse Association. Coach Bob Hayes says the 24-year-old Fagan has paid his dues. He's prepared himself uh, by learning our defensive systems, being in shape. So he's, he's done everything he's in control of to make sure he can make this team. You won't see Fagan fill the stat sheet. His main objective? Playing tough lacrosse. Welcoming the role of unsung hero. When you can get a guy who's got really good character, that means he's coachable and he wants to learn. And you know he's a type of guy that you, know, you could take 15 of them on a team. And it's those role guys that uh, do the, the gritty and the, the, the dirty little things that uh, they actually make a championship team. Don't let that can your scores! The defending Man Cup champion Shamrocks are aiming to repeat with over a dozen local players on this year's roster. These guys are gonna learn trial by fire and, uh, and that's gonna be good for them. That's gonna be a, a great learning experience that, you know, that the Shamrocks have always had a target on on their back. And those stories like Fagan's may warm the heart. Coach Bob Hayes says the priority is winning. And homegrown or not, players have to earn and keep their spot. Truly, it comes down to what you're going to do on the floor. You can have all the heart in the world. You still have to be able to, to play at this level. This is the closest Josh Fagan has ever come to the Man Cup. He didn't touch it then, perhaps knowing one day he'd have the chance to earn it.
You can follow Josh Fagan and the rest of the Shamrocks all summer long at the Q Center in Colwood. You can check the link for their schedule. All right, we've got to take a quick break, but check this out. Fans behind me, they think I'm uh, part of the team. I'm going to get the treatment. Watch this. All right. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah, in a bit. In a bit, for sure. For sure. Yeah, in a bit. You got it. You got it. Watching VI Sports on Shaw TV. Welcome back. Stumbled upon a very nice story here at Royal Athletic Park. Sandy Crisp, he taught for 35 years in the Victoria School District. He's retiring and he threw out the opening pitch. First off, that, those can be nerve wracking. How'd well, it go? I was very nervous. And when I got out there, it was a lot further than I thought. And I, I really wanted to throw a strike. So I was happy I did. So over 600 students and staff are here in your honor. What does that mean to you? It's, it's really cool because I'm all about the children and the parents. And I, I really love working with the people at Oakland School. So to have 600 people here and students is incredible. And it's extra special because in the introduction, when they were introducing you for the opening pitch, I heard them speak about a few charities that you've been connected to over the years. Tell me, tell the viewer uh, where a portion of the proceeds for the 50-50 are going today. 75% today is going to uh, a foundation called the Team for Hope, which is funding neuroblastoma research. Neuroblastoma is the type of cancer that affects children, and it's, it's a, a cancer that's very difficult to beat. In fact, we had a young student, Renee Soto, who was in grade four at our school, and he had died last summer. And it, it really hits home when you see a young child dying. We've had several cases at our school of children and families dealing with cancer. So I thought if we could give some uh, money to the cancer research today, I'd be very happy with that. Great cause indeed. Let me ask you about retirement. What are your plans? Well, I'm hoping to uh, not have to get up so early in the morning. Um, I want to travel. I'm a country and western fan, so I want to go to Nashville. Really looking forward to going to Greece also. Well, Sandy, thanks so much and uh, enjoy retirement. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Before we went to the break, we featured the defending Western Lacrosse Association champion Victoria Shamrocks. But they're not the only island team to capture the illustrious Man Cup. For our next story, we head up Highway 1 to Nanaimo, where our own Todd Jones takes a trip through memory lane. The year was 1956. The first time a senior A Timberman lacrosse team qualified for and won the national championship, the Man Cup. It was my first year up to the big team. I had played, I'm thinking, the year before with my three brothers in the Senior B Championship in Rossland. And we had a tryout for the big team the next year and a few of us made it. We came close in 55. Uh, we, we got to the, the uh, league finals of that and, and lost. And, and we kept all of the players, or most of the players that we had had that year. When our great executives start importing all our Easter, made, them, made us a contender right there. Bringing Bobby Allen from back east, uh, who was one of the top players at that time, and Harry Whipper as a coach and a player. Uh, that, that really gave us a, a leg up on the rest of the, the league here. So right from the beginning of the season, I thought we had a good chance to, to win. Her, my first, been my first year in the league, in the big league, and having a chance to do that. To, some players play for a lifetime and never go to the Man Cup. We had a great bunch of guys that built that team. So that was very special. Nanaimo would end up sweeping Vancouver in the league finals, sending the team into the Man Cup to face off against the Peterborough Lakers in Toronto at Maple Leaf Gardens. We had no idea what sort of a team Peterborough had, uh, most of us that played out west. In one way, we were fortunate that we played in Toronto because it took the hometown advantage away from them by moving the games to Toronto. 
to win those two early games in, in overtime, uh, you know, really made us feel good. Uh, I think we were a little bit overconfident when we played our fourth game, and they beat us handily the, the fourth game. Uh, and I think that uh, made us concentrate on, on game five, that we didn't want it to go any further. And so a, a phenomenal experience when, you know, when the final whistle finally goes and, and you realize that you're a uh, Canadian champion, it was a phenomenal experience to win back there. The only uh, regret why is uh, never had, never having the chance to play in front of our fans for the Man Cup. They were the greatest lacrosse fans ever. The Nanaimo fans may not have seen their team play a Man Cup game, but they showed their appreciation for the team in when the players returned home. People lined the streets here, they had welcome us home. And so there were convertibles there waiting for us and took us through. Uh, the city up to the old post office, and the, the streets were just packed. So the, the whole experience of uh, you know, the Nanaimo coming together uh, for that was uh, a phenomenal thing, and uh, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. In Nanaimo, for VI Sports, I'm Todd Jones. Good stuff, thanks Todd. Now amidst all the major springtime and summer team sports like baseball and lacrosse, track and field often gets left out of the fray. But kicking off June in Nanaimo was a provincial track meet that became one of the city's largest sporting events ever. Our own Derek Johnstone has the story. Hopefully a win, <laughs> that's kind of a given. but um. I want to try to break the record of uh, a BC kid that jumped, I think it's 2010 he jumped, he jumped 466. Jason Clare, one of Nanaimo's notable athletes, was immersed in this friendly but competitive environment here at Nanaimo's Rotary Bowl. These youthful athletes, over 2,600 of them, came together at the start of June for the BC High School Track and Field Championships. I think in many ways Nanaimo uh, doesn't realize what's happening here because it's uh, it kind of goes under the radar. It's a huge event. It's probably one of the largest single sporting events that Nanaimo has ever hosted. But it sure means that there's an awful lot of uh, people, money, uh, come into town. Uh, we're going to be able to showcase our town. We're going to be able to showcase our facility, which is really what we want to do. Well, it's uh, a tremendous privilege to have the, the meet here. This is the first time since 1972 that it's been held outside the, the lower mainland. So this is a, a very rare thing. As well as any economic or tourism potential that the huge meet would have had for Nanaimo, it also has provided another significant opportunity, home field advantage for our local athletes. Sprinter Hassi Fashina Bambaka is a Wellington secondary student that has an appreciation for hometown support. Oh, okay, I'm ready for finals. <laughs> for past years, it's been in Langley and you know, no one, I'm the only sprinter from my school too, so it's like, my friends I've made from track and my parents and my, yeah, my brothers and sisters and like that's it. But then if like here, since it's here, there's like people from my school coming to watch, people who know me from like different schools coming to watch and like there's teachers who's like coming to watch, it's like really, really good. When I'm alone and out of meet, it just doesn't seem like as big of a deal to me. So whereas here it's, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be people are going to be supporting me, cheering me on. So that'll give me the push to hopefully break the record. Jason took the gold medal in pole vault with ease and had his sights on setting a new record at the championships. But the end goal for the elite athletes here extends far beyond this competition. I want to make um, more national teams, Team Canada, hopefully. So, um, And then I, I'm going to university next year for pole vault as well. So I'll have a few years of that. And then, of course, Olympics, hopefully one year. Chat for teams, chat for schools. Get a scholarship and make team, like any team, I'm okay with it, yeah. Long term, some of them could potentially get uh, scholarships, would take them through the university so they can leave various universities with a degree that's been paid for. But the other thing is I think that the determination and the ability to stay focused for a long period of time is going to help them whatever they do, whether it's getting a degree, going into a particular work area, being able to focus and be productive. From hurdles and running to the hammer throw and javelin, helping our local athletes focus and grow their competitive skills is the Nanaimo Track and Field Club. Nanaimo Track and Field Club uh, is a volunteer organization. We're really just devoted to 
promoting athletics and developing young athletes. Uh, we have about 200 members. We're one of the largest clubs in BC. We've grown tremendously over the last few years, and uh, we have a, a, an absolutely fabulous group of parents and volunteers who uh, make the club a, a, a tremendously positive experience for everybody. With the club's support, Hassey won bronze medals for the 100 and 200 meter events. Despite his gold medal vault though, Jason couldn't quite set that new provincial record. But for both athletes and for track and field in Nanaimo, the future is very bright. For VI Sports, I'm Derek Johnstone. Queer followed by Georgia Lamb. Don't mention it. You didn't ask for it. The BC Track and Field Championships next year take place June 1st to 3rd. The site has yet to be determined. All right, we got to take our own little seventh inning stretch, but stick with us because when we come back, the Harbor Cats show us their true game face. Watching VI Sports on Shaw TV. Welcome back. Now, since the game's birth in the mid 19th century, baseball has been known as the numbers game. Stats like ERA, batting percentage, OBP, essentially determining a player's worth. But we here at Shaw TV would have to disagree. There's also the intangibles of the sport, the stuff you can't measure through stats or percentages, the stuff that can turn an average ball player into an icon. So earlier today, we took three Victoria Harbor Cats and put them to the ultimate test to find out their baseball talent beyond the numbers. Let's meet our competitors. Walnut Creek, California's Austin Dondonville, La Quinta, California's Casey Costello, and Edmond, Oklahoma's Holden Lions. The players will compete in three categories. Are you ready? Speech delivery, creative handshakes, and a baseball card photo shoot. The players will be given a score out of 10 for each category. Here are the judges. Pitching coach Joe Fobb, team general manager Brad Norris Jones, and Shaw TV intern Jessica Williamson. Round one, speech delivery. Baseball players are known for their historic poignant speeches. So we had the players recite a line from the famous Lou Gehrig retirement speech. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Some people will say that I've had a bad break, but today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Go Cats, baby. I would give him a 5 out of 10. Donovanville came in and I don't think he really understood the, the magnitude of the speech. Oh, it was a solid 5. 5. Yeah. And why, why 5? Uh, he came in soft. I feel like he did not bring his A game. I would give that a 4.5 out of 10. Oh, I already messed this up. Some people may say that I've had a bad break, but I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I'm gonna give Casey a seven. Casey brought his game, he was seven and a half. I feel like he could have worked better on his pronunciation and articulation, four out of 10. People will say I've had a bad break, but today, but today I consider today, myself, I consider myself, consider myself, consider myself, 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 myself. The luckiest, the luckiest man, luckiest man, luckiest man, luckiest man on the face of the earth. Face the earth. The earth. It was Joey Bautista bat flip time, hit a nine. Nine out of ten. Holden's a baseball guy. I think he's been around and seen and seen some of these speeches and some of these old schoolers. So uh, I think he has a real appreciation for it and it came out in the way he delivered his speech. Nine out of 10. I felt like the emotion was just really, it was real, it was there. Round two, creative handshakes. Players had to teach and execute handshakes with our volunteer and rookie creative handshaker, Jessica Williamson. I'm gonna give Donovanville a nine out of ten for his for his efforts and uh, his ability to instruct. Oh, he just seven. He just messed it up. I'll rate it eight out of ten because although it was complex, he did a good job of teaching it to me, and there were some solid moves in it. 
Holden did a great job of bringing some energy with how simple the handshake was, um, but I don't think it was on the level as Dominic's, so I'm going to give him a seven. I think he could have been a bit more patient teaching it to me, but I feel like it was really solid again, really fun, so I'll give that one an eight as well. It was good, it was interesting, but eight. I'm gonna give Casey a seven as well. I think it was a good handshake, but I, I didn't, I don't feel the energy coming from Casey right now. Kind of a sly move if you ask me, but I'll give him a nine out of 10 because it was really funny. Unbelievably original. It was great. I loved it because it's just something different, and that's what he is. I gave him a nine. That was good. Round three, the baseball card photo shoot. Baseball cards are big business. A mint condition Honus Wagner sells for over $2 million. Let's see how the guys fare. He's going with the, uh, with the ginger ninja sign right there. I like it. Bring it bringing some of the head coach out in the baseball card is always good. Um, I'm going to give him an eight, though. I don't like what Casey did there. He's trying to act like Coach Merritt on that one. He's a four. 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 I think it's a pretty cool pose. I do like it. I will give him an 8.5 out of 10. Next up was Austin Dondonville. I'm going to give him a 7. That's good. Donnie got a solid 9.5 there for doing that. He took my pose. That's why he got 9.5. So Austin copied the pose from somebody else he saw doing it. So that's not really original, really not really creative. So I'm going to give him a 4 out of 10. And last in the spotlight, Holden Lions. I love it. I love it. It's uh. It's, it's him to a T. His personality comes out a lot in this picture. I'm going to give it a nine. Got the ball toss. Kind of having fun with the game. That's how we, that's how we are right here. It's good. Eight. Eight out of ten. Yep. I really like the originality of throwing the ball. I feel like that was a really smart move on his part, so I'm going to give him a nine out of ten. After our final tally over three rounds of fierce competition, our winner, Holden Lions. <laughs> It's always good to come out on top. My coach back home always reminds us that winning doesn't suck, and you know, he's riding that every single time. So I love to win. Good on those guys to let loose. That's awesome. All right, now for our last story, our volunteer reporter Mark Robertson checks out a smaller sports community in Langford with a big heart. When I was a kid, extreme biking came in the form of banana seats and high handlebars. But a lot of people grew up with BMX, and when it comes to BMX racing, the place to be is right here in Colwood at Victoria BMX. It may have come a bit late for me, but these days, riders of all ages are flocking to Victoria's world-class BMX track. I think our youngest rider is just under two years old and the ranges go right from two years old right through to 60 years old. It encourages a strong family outlet. Sarah's first time at the track, she's got a one-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old. What are you thinking so far about Victoria BMX? I'm excited to be here. The idea of BMX racing seems like a lifetime type of thing to get involved with. And six-year-old Dominic, a.k.a. The Dominator, is certainly serious about BMX, already an expert in his class. Yeah, he has. Uh, he went to Amsterdam on Sunday at the Gold Cup, and uh, yeah, he's the youngest expert in Canada right now. Okay, so obviously something he's going to want to continue on for a while. Yeah, uh, yeah we're uh, actually hitting the Nationals in Squamish. We're doing the American National Circuit as well this year. So uh, we went down to Oregon, we placed first out there as well. Victoria BMX truly is a first-rate track, having hosted the World Championships in 2007 and offering different levels of competition for the novice all the way up to the expert. What does it take to be a serious BMX racer? Uh, practice. Practice is everything. And just putting in the hours, like really getting your legs conditioned for the races, because it's, it, I mean, it's all, it's sprinting, right? Mm -hmm. So really like doing sprints at home, always on your bike, coming down the track every time it's open, like that all helps for sure. This is the kind of sport where uh, it's really just the individual against the clock or against the other racers in the gate, and there's nothing holding back any child at all. And we've found even for my oldest son, who sometimes has some difficulty in school, that uh, this was one of the first sports we came across where he was just free to, uh, to be himself and to really excel.
four years and it's really fun to race because you get to move around. The competitiveness into it, like the chance of falling or not. I race because it's fun and it's awesome and I love it. I'm Mark Robertson and Victoria BMX having fun with the kids and with the adults and... You're watching BMX Sports! Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mark. The BMX Victoria track is hosting the Vancouver Island Nationals July 29th to the 31st. It features some of the best BMX racers in North America. Well, that's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, at BI Sports Guy, for links to online episodes, plus sports news in your community. On behalf of everyone at BI Sports, thank you again. I'm Kevin Schrack. Stay tuned for our GoPro close-up. I'm going to devour this cotton chips. We'll see ya. Hi, I'm Zoe. And we're the Blue Dynamites. And this is your GoPro close-up. Hot